there's aspects of fear that will cripple you. There are aspects of fear that will, that will empower you. Climate change doesn't give a damn whether your oil is ethical or not. What would a life look like where you didn't trust anybody? It'd be a really empty life. My name is Drew Dudley. I'm the founder and chief catalyst of Nuance Leadership who have decided to put together the Leaders Lounge. I want to thank you all so much for coming out. This is what we were looking for. We are looking for great guests, uh, in an in, in, uh, small crowds, intimate atmosphere, and a chance to hear great ideas. And we're hoping that this is the start of, of something great. Uh, we used to do this at the University of Toronto Scarborough, bringing great people to, to share their ideas in a way that they don't have to prep a speech. We just sit down in comfy chairs and chat, and we're incredibly excited to try this new adventure tonight. And if we're going to start an adventure, I thought, who better to start an adventure with than the world-renowned adventurer George Coronis and it actually says that world-renowned adventurer. I'm not sure when you become renowned or who you become renowned with if there's like a if there's rankings or something but I'm gonna go with what's on his website now I'm gonna do my best to do this without the notes that some of you in the front can see clearly sitting on the chair in front of me but our guest tonight is one of the world's most active storm chasers and I'm not sure when you become an inactive storm chaser I think that's <laughs> Things yeah, I was going to be, how many successful training jumps must a parachutist make? All of them, all right? He's, he is a renowned, a world-renowned adventurer. He is an explorer. He is an award-winning television show host. I'm assuming, even if you've never won an award, you can buy trophies. So just go out, get one little plaque on it. I will give you one after this, and it will be best guest of the night, regardless. <laughs> His show, Angry Planet, has been broadcast in over 100 countries. He has appeared as an expert on the National Geographic Channel, on CNN, on BBC. Uh, he has chased tornadoes, water spouts, and hurricanes. He's gone nose to nose with gorillas, great white sharks, and alligators. Uh, he's even been the first human being to set foot on a newly formed island that was created by volcanic activity. He has been dog sledding in the Arctic kayaking with whales in the Antarctic, he is, and he's flown in zero gravity. He has, he's a member of the National Geographic, or Canadian Geographic Society. He is a member of the Explorers Club. He has been nominated for two Gemini Awards. I was lucky enough to meet him for the first time at TEDx Toronto a year ago, when he did the single most dangerous thing I think he has ever done, and that is attempt to steal my beloved stuffed penguin, <laughs> Sydney. Hopefully tonight will be a lot easier. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our first ever guest to the Leaders' Lounge, George Coronis. Thank you, my friend. my friend. Thank you. Yeah, make sure you're turned on there. Are you turned uh, on? I think I'm on. Is he on? Am I on? I'm on. Can you guys hear him? Excellent. Did I, did I just look cool. at the first guest I ever had in this and say, are you turned on? <laughs> well, in that shirt, I'm starting to wonder. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we look awesome with these mustaches. We sure do. I really... Is, are these not great? We have, we have done the least amount of work possible for Movember. We're just like, just, just do that part right there. That's you see, you've got, you've got the pimp thing going on, and I've got the 70s porn star look going on. But it's almost the same mustache. <laughs> you, you suggesting some other relationship here? No, I'm just... <laughs> I'm just wondering about this whole Movember thing, because... I'm using it as an excuse because I always wanted to look this terrible. I've never had one before. I've, had to go to, I've never had a mustache before and I'm kind of... Because you need a mustache to feel badass. You know, it does help. They really? say a man without a mustache is like tea without the sugar. Really? Yeah. By the way, the sugar here is liquid. If anyone's asking for sugar, I'm just... <laughs> uh, George, you think of things slightly differently than uh, almost anyone I've ever met. And I was trying to find a way to start this off and to demonstrate uh, to people who might not have seen your show just how your mind works a little bit differently and how what you love in your life it might, be, might make you look at the world differently than we do. And I, I got a quote from your show. You, you flew 20 hours to Sydney, Australia, mm -hmm. and while you're packing your rental car in the, in the parking lot, you look up and you say, I don't even remember all this. Things are looking positive. There's already convection going on and it's starting to rain. <laughs> things are looking positive. It's starting to rain. When you're a storm chaser, that's a good thing. Why don't you explain to us what a storm chaser... What do you do for a living, George? For I those of you who don't know you really well, <laughs> explain, explain your life. What do you do for a living that makes you look up and say, oh, things are looking great, rain? <laughs> well, um, I do a lot of things for a living, but, but I, I'm, just as you described, an adventurer, an explorer, and storm chaser. And basically what I've done is, starting about 15 years ago, I was working as an engineer building and designing recording studios for a living. And as a hobby, I would take my two weeks vacation time and I would go chase tornadoes. I tried it for the first time in 1998 and it was amazing. I, I saw my first tornado, it, it was 
not very photogenic at all, but it was really close and it was really exciting and I got hooked. Kept going back every year and uh, to the, got to the point where I was the guy that was getting the phone call because I had the reputation of being the person who was always on the scene when all hell was breaking loose somewhere. <laughs> and it just developed more and I was selling photos and selling stock footage and next thing I know I'm getting tapped on the shoulder to basically create my own television show based on my own life. Basically, they pay me to do the stuff that I was paying to do before. So, but how did you get to that first one? Was it a, a buddy of yours, sort of, while you're, while you're recording one after? He's like, you know what we should do tomorrow? Do you know, you know yeah. those things that people run from, terrified screaming? Yeah. We should go check that out. Well, so how, how did the first one, you say, I saw my first one, but well, I've never seen a tornado. Yeah, well, so. at the time, I had no idea what I was doing, but I was learning. And I learned that there were a few people that lived in Oklahoma, down in the central United States, where they have the tornado alley. That's sort of where about... About 80% uh, of the world's tornadoes occur, give or take. And there's a guy, guy down there by the name of Charles Edwards, and he runs a company called Cloud9 Tours. And it's like he would take people storm chasing with him, he'd been doing it for many years, basically to fund his own chasing. He used to sell his own blood plasma to storm chase, to make money to storm chase. Okay, this is how dedicated this guy is. So I called him up and went down and hooked up with him for two weeks, went storm chasing. And then a few years later, I was actually working with him as the lead driver for his storm chasing tour company. And I've been doing that since 2004. And uh, it's just sort of this, it's been this weird, it's, it's, it's not really a job, it's not really a career, it's more of a lifestyle than anything else. That's the way I kind of like to look at it. Because it's not like I get up uh, and, you know, storm, storm chasing every day at nine and come home at five. It doesn't work like that. It's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's opportunistic. So... Every day I know, I've got my finger on the pulse of the planet, I know which volcanoes are erupting, I know where, there, where there's been earthquakes, I know where there's tornado potential, I know what hurricanes are going on, if there's a, if there's a, a, a typhoon in the Pacific, and if I'm able to go, I go and I document it, and, and, and people get to see it, and the coolest thing is I get to share it with people, that's really awesome. I've been very, very fortunate and privileged to be able to travel and go to all these amazing places, literally all seven continents, over 40 countries, and I feel that I have an obligation to share what I have done. So years ago I sort of made this decision that the purpose of my life, the cool thing about life is that you can decide what the purpose is. And I decided that my purpose was to document the most extreme aspects of nature and share that with as many people as possible. Simple. That, that is why I'm alive. That's why I breathe every day. And, and, and I've and been how, able to do it. And how old were you when, when you came to that? Because any audience I speak to when it comes to the purpose, as soon as someone says purpose of life, yeah. you see people lean forward being like, no, tell me how you found that because I'm looking for that. <laughs> how old were you when you the said, oh, this is my decision. Purpose. You just have to figure out what you like. It, I actually came into this a bit later in life. Um, I was very passionate when I was younger about music. And the music led me to working in recording studios. Working in recording studios led me to working in television studios. Working in television studios helped me to understand the process of making television, which made it easier for me to get my own TV series when I had already learned about all these different Earth's forces and extremes. So, in retrospect, everything made perfect sense. At the time, it was a mad woman's footprints. <laughs> if, if I went back and asked your parents, would they have said that they saw this coming? Like, were you the no. kid who was like climbing <laughs> up, climbing up with uh, the ladder with your, your bike on your back to the roof? And what are you doing, George? Nothing. 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 Like, Nothing. like when, I, when you were a kid, if I asked your teachers, your parents, would they have been like, "Yeah, George is going to is one day going to chase these destructive forces"? Or just last week, I was back in my hometown, and my my sister is now a school teacher there. So I got to go back, and literally, my kindergarten teacher came to a talk that I was giving. I'm like, how cool is that? You know, I'm, I'm 40 years old now, <laughs> and, and there's my kindergarten teacher, and she remembered me and everything, but, but, but no one saw it. I didn't see it coming. I always did have a passion for nature. I could name every single exotic, weird dinosaur with the proper pronunciation. My heroes were Jacques Cousteau and, and Indiana Jones. So you take those <laughs> two and mix them together, and that's pretty much what my, my life has ended up being. Now, you were the first man to ever film inside a tornado, yeah. a hurricane, and a volcano. volcano. Yeah, the first person to ever do all three. Okay. Yeah. Now, my question is, uh, a, a couple questions. One, did you, did you set out to do that? Or is it, do they call you afterwards? They're like, guess what? Uh, no. Or, <laughs> and, and the other was, <laughs> like, is there like, a, uh, that's what I wonder, is like world renowned. Is there like a tracking system where people are just like, oh, wow, someone just did all three of these. Now, one, how do you get inside a tornado? When they say you filmed inside a tornado, yeah. what does that mean? And, and, and were, did you set out to say, okay, there are things that haven't been done 
uh, I'm going to not only film inside a tornado, but I'm going to do these other two as well. Wow, that's like six questions there. No, um, <laughs> no it was not intentional. But getting inside a tornado was not intentional. That was actually a big mistake on my part. I would think so, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what I try to get close, I try to do a dangerous thing in as safe a manner as possible. All right? that's, like, that's what I tell my mom and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm getting the look. She, she's there. You know. I know. Duh. Duh, she's in the room. Duh. Um, it was May 2003. I'm with uh, a partner of mine, Storm Chasing, just the two of us. It's nighttime. Typically, I don't chase tornadoes at night because it's too dangerous. You can't see them. That's true. But this particular tornado was headed right for Oklahoma City. Very high profile storm. I had radar in the car. I could see the shape of the storm on radar. I could see exactly where the tornado was. I was listening to the local radio, and it was actually the TV broadcast being sent on the radio. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Over I know. Uh, and it was... Um, and put that right back where it was. And I was basically getting a, like a sports play-by-play, so I knew exactly where the storm was. I knew exactly where the tornado was. So I decided to chase that night, which, which in retrospect was a mistake. So. I'm heading north, and all of a sudden, there's, there's all these people around, and then there's fewer people, and then there's a few other storm chasers, and then there's nobody. That's a bad sign. <laughs> and when, then, when the storm chasers bail, this is a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. And then stuff just started flying, literally. Um, transformers were exploding beside the car. Two-by-fours flying through the air. Uh, it was like driving through a swarm of bees. I immediately had to crank the wheel, floor the gas to try and keep up with the wind, to lessen the impact of all the stuff hitting the car. And I hid behind a shopping mall, and you could see this dark mass just basically pass right over us. And it took about 15 minutes for my leg to stop shaking. And I turned to my chase partner, and he's like, are you okay? I was like, yeah, are you okay? Yeah. Should we keep chasing it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> so we, we, we kept going. We ended up chasing it through Oklahoma City, and uh, we almost ran into it a second time, actually. <laughs> But uh, we got lucky because it was very weak at that point. It went on and strengthened. But from that day on, now I don't, I don't chase at night. It's just too dangerous, unless I'm chasing lightning or something like that. But well, that's the question. Is that the inherent in the idea of chasing something is that you want to catch it. My question is, when, you, you, storm, do you, when you storm chase, <laughs> you, you're taking, you know, you say that there's a storm chasing tour and you bring, you know, people like maybe me yep. along. Yep. When you catch the storm, how do, you, how do you define catching the storm? And then what do you do once you've caught it besides turn around and immediately try to not have it catch you? Well, ca catching it in, in, in our world means getting into a position where you can see the tornado from a safe location and document it, right? Now, sometimes, depending upon the roads, it's two miles away. Sometimes it's five miles away. Sometimes it's 200 meters away. And that's what we like is when there's a tornado that has touched down, preferably in a field that's not affecting anyone, not hitting anybody, not destroying any farms, but just out in the pasture, maybe scaring the prairie dogs. And if it crosses the road ahead of us and we're maybe 100 or 200 meters away, that is exhilarating because you can feel the wind, you can smell the dirt getting ripped up, and you can just see this beautiful storm that's twice the height of Mount Everest concentrating all of its energy down onto one point that's grinding up this field. And being next to something that's that big and that powerful and that fleeting it's really an amazing feeling. Now, you chase storms uh, in a boat called the SS No Fear? Uh, <laughs> not the SS No Fear. Is it actually a question of no fear? Are you, do you actually have no fear, or do you have a different type of relationship with fear than, than other people? Like, is, is the question of, are storm chasers fearless, right. or is it a, simply a different way of approaching fear? There are... Uh, there's aspects of fear that will cripple you, there are aspects of fear that will, that will empower you. And what I do is I use fear, I'm not without fear. People think, oh, you must be so brave and so fearless. It's like, no, not at all. Because if I don't have fear, that's when I make mistakes, that's when I put myself into jeopardy, when I start to feel too complacent in a situation. Like literally, I climb into erupting volcanoes, I, I wrestle, I've wrestled anacondas and swam with piranhas. Sure, it's scary, absolutely. But it's a calculated risk that I take. I've never broken a single bone doing any of this stuff. I've never been hospitalized doing any of this stuff. And I take the fear and I use it as a tool to help me stay sharp. And I guess I have a higher tolerance for that type of visceral, physical endangerment than most people have. But I don't consider myself a thrill seeker. 
It's funny, a few, uh, a few months ago I was in New York City and I was being interviewed by Bear Grylls from Man vs. Wild and we were talking about adrenaline and I was explaining to him that what I do, I'm a nature junkie, not an adrenaline junkie, so I'm fascinated by nature, I have this, this insatiable curiosity and the adrenaline that comes along with that is a byproduct. I don't go and climb the volcano to get the adrenaline, adrenaline rush, I climb the volcano to see the volcano but there's adrenaline, adrenaline that happens along with it, you know? And so by, by having that type of mindset and, and embracing the fear and working with the fear, I'm able to do things that most people would either never be able to or wouldn't want to do, but they can view it and live vicariously through, through what I do, through the show, through the web and all these different uh, outlets. So when you, talk, when you talk about relationships, people often say you can have a healthy relationship, yeah. you can have a dysfunctional relationship. Sure. What do you think is the definition of a healthy relationship with fear? Well, here's the thing. What, you think about opposites, right? Love, hate. What's the opposite of fear? Curiosity. Oh. Right? If you're curious about something, you go and investigate it. If you're afraid of something, you back away from it. So that curiosity, if you, if you're, if you live in a world that's 50-50, fear and curiosity, that's not really a great place to live. You want to you wanna stack the cards in favor of curiosity because that's where all the interesting, that's where, that's where life is. That's where the interesting things are. That's, where you, that's when you go outside your comfort zone to go and find new things, to explore new places and do things that you've never done before. And people who have phobias and things like that, that's where you have this extreme example of zero curiosity and extreme fear. And I kind of turn the tables on that. When you do these, what is it that you, is it the moment right before, is it the actual experience or is it the rush afterwards that you most seek? Is it that, okay, this is about to happen, there's going to be the storm or, or we're about to hit the, the summit, mm -hmm. uh, I'm about to see the shark. Is it that moment before? Is it the moment where the explosion's happening or, or the, the creature's there? Or is it afterwards? Or is it maybe even now, being able to look way back on it? What is it that, that really fuels you? That's right before, during, or after? Wow. It, it, it's all of the above. Like, I love the anticipation and preparation of getting ready for, for an expedition. Like, if I'm getting ready in, in May to go tornado chasing, I mean, I'm really looking forward to it. If I'm planning a, a flight to the Congo to go climb a volcano, I'm really looking forward to that, the anticipation and the research going into it, anticipating what I'm going to see. And because it's nature, anything can happen. So there's always that uncertainty. When you're there, you're, you're, you're using your senses. You're, you're seeing, you're smelling, you're feeling all the, the environment. If it's a storm or a volcano. Or that, this thing. Or, or the blinds. Um, and then afterwards... The part that I really like is, is the sharing, really. And the interval between when we film something and when it airs is, is terrible for me because the experience has been done, but people don't get to see it. And I want people to see it because there's a lot of cool stuff out there that, that you're probably never going to get to see or, or hell, just drop everything and go see it, you know? So... People tend to fall into two different categories when they talk to me. They think either, wow, that's amazing, I would love to do what you do, or they think you're a complete nut bar. You know. Quick straw poll. <laughs> quick, <laughs> quick show of hands. <laughs> what, um, Who would like to come tornado chasing? There we go. Cool. It can be arranged. Come see me afterwards. I can take you. One thing I know is often we do all the Q and A's at the end. You know, we're we're learning as we go. Like for next time, we'll tie this up and take it away. Yeah. And can you guys can you guys hear? Okay. Yeah. All right. Why do it? Because conventional. Every now and then, let's just stop and ask. Is there anybody else in the audience who's got who has the next question for George? I can keep doing it, and we do Q and A at the end. But if anyone's got something they want to know now, anyone have a question? We'll come back at the end again. All right. You got a big ear. You wrote on your Twitter, which I follow. Uh-oh. Um, Uh-oh. <laughs> uh -oh. You know everyone follows that. You know, no, when, you're, when you write that stuff down, people see it. You the know problem that. is my mother's now following it. <laughs> For years, my mother had no internet connection whatsoever. And it was great because she never knew what was going on until after it happened. <laughs> <laughs> Until she got an internet account, <laughs> she, no, she, she, she has an internet account. Well, I, I <laughs> you still get those? internet access. I know. I sound like a, an old dude. <laughs> yeah, because right uh, now these guys are like that. They, I know. I know. I, forgive me. It sounds like a lot of what you uh, 
of what you do is about other people too. I mean, obviously you enjoy doing it, but it's saying, you know, you want to share it with other people. Uh, how much of what you do is about you mm-hmm. and how much of what you do is about, is about others and in what way? Well, primarily going and, and, and chasing storms and doing these other adventures is, is in and of itself, it's sort of, It's me sort of living out my boyhood dreams, sort of thing. You know, when people, when they are growing up, they want to be a fireman or an astronaut. And for me, I'm actually able to do these things and satisfy that personal, you know, vim and vigor for for these adventures. And being able to share is just so amazing as well. And I get so many people that contact me and email me and send me messages on Twitter, including my mom. you know, is being very encouraging and wanting to learn, and especially when I do talks at schools, they're very interested and they want to find out more, and they're filled with a zillion questions. And I find that I get as much enjoyment out of sharing these experiences as I do, I think, doing them. Because when you do it, it happens and it's over in that moment. But you can share that experience for the rest of your life. And I think real fulfillment in life comes out of serving others and when you are so passionate about something and you can find other people that are also passionate then sharing with other people really makes it makes all the effort and trouble worthwhile when you see the show you don't typically see all the effort that goes into it we'll shoot for two weeks to shoot a half hour show and there are times when I'm on the top of for example I'm in the Congo on Mount Niragongo volcano 12,000 feet up. We're on the equator, but it's freezing cold up there. There's poisonous gas inundating our tent. You see a little bit of this in, in, the, in the video, but I'm camped out in this tent, and it's pouring rain every night. Thunder and lightning. I, for sure my tent is going to blow into the volcano. I've got explosive diarrhea. You know, the glamorous stuff. You know, television is just, it's all, it's just like Jersey Shore. Um, and, and, we filter that stuff out because some people are not so interested in that. Um, but, but, the, but, but the experience in going there and doing that is extremely cool and people love it and, and I just love, love sharing because, like I said, I can do it for years to keep sharing it. Now you share the experiences. If you had to share, obviously you've had the experiences, you can tell the tales of the experiences. What about the lessons from the experiences? When you take the cumulative yep. of all these things that you've done from, yep. from riding an alligator five seconds after you meet the guy, um, approach them from the side and hold on. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. Yeah. That's a nice training you got there. Um, <laughs> to, to climbing uh, and being on top volcanoes, to, to chasing hurricanes and tornadoes. When you take all of that into account and you, and you can share the experiences, mm-hmm. what, are, what are the lessons from those adventures that you can share with others? If it's to serve others, what have you pulled from these experiences that people who don't chase tornadoes can right. still use? Well, there's several lessons. The first and foremost is probably don't try this at home. <laughs> right? Um, but, but seriously, one very cool thing is that I show people nature at its very worst. And if people are, let's say, in the path of a tornado, they might think, wow, I, I, know na- I now know how bad these can be. I've seen it on television. I've seen this guy do these crazy things. Maybe I should get to the basement. And what you don't see is that while we're out storm chasing, we've got a, a direct line to the National Weather Service and Environment Canada. And if we see a tornado heading for a town, we'll send in the report so that they get the message to, to, to issue a tornado warning and maybe we've saved some lives. We don't know. I'll never know. That's kind of a cool thing. Maybe I've saved lives, maybe I haven't. I just, I'll never ever know that. But it's nice for me to know that at least I can show people what can happen in a worst case scenario and take precautions. And I try to make the show interesting and entertaining, but as well educational, at least to a certain degree, um, to show people what to do in certain situations, what not to do, things to watch out for. If you see the sky looking this certain way, then start to take caution, things like that. So there are some actual lessons in there that could actually save your life. Does it ever, does it ever bother you that the, thing that the things you chase 
that seem to give you a real rush and, and make your life feel complete. Does it ever bother you that those things can destroy mm. other people's lives entirely who aren't looking for them? You'll fly to Jamaica in an empty plane knowing that the plane coming back will be packed of people running from what you're chasing. And it destroys, and you go in and you go out. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you deal with that? Does it ever make you feel somehow as if, wow, this thing that adds so much to my life I can only experience this when other people experience loss. That is a very difficult thing for me. That's probably the most difficult aspect. And yeah, absolutely. Let me give you a, a really current example. Just this, this past May, the city of Joplin, Missouri took a direct hit from an EF5 tornado. Tremendous damage. It's the worst I've ever seen. And there were quite a, quite a few fatalities there. And I was chasing that day. It, it happened to be my birthday, so I was in a great mood. It was, it was really great. It was the first day of our second tour, so we had a whole bunch of new people. And boy, were they in for a surprise because we were chasing the storm and it wasn't looking very good. We were not too impressed. And then suddenly the storm went ballistic, produced this massive tornado that just raked through this city. We couldn't see the tornado because it was completely wrapped up in rain. And I was driving, trying to keep up with it. And I had to watch my speed because I didn't want to drive into it. So it was a very tense situation. And then we came across the spot where the tornado had just crossed the highway moments before. And there was about a dozen 18-wheeler tractor trailers that were flipped over on the highway. We had to stop. Uh, literally a van full of brand new people. Welcome to Oklahoma. Here's what it's like. And pulled off on the side of the road. We immediately went into first responder mode and had to run from truck to truck to check on these drivers. There was one guy who had a pretty serious head wound. He had to be taken to a hospital. So it really opens your eyes to the power of nature. Now, I never wish for any of these phenomena to, to impact populated areas, but if it does happen, I'll be there to document it. And I'm so small and compared to nature that I, I can't have any control over it. But maybe if I can help get the word out, maybe save a few lives, possibly, you know, that's always a good thing. But it really is um, difficult to, to come to terms with at times. But I look at it like this. These are natural phenomena. They only become natural disasters when they affect human populations, right? If you have a hurricane that's out in the Atlantic that's spinning away, it doesn't affect anyone. It's not a disaster. It's just a phenomenon. It's only when we build our cities and, of course, now they seem to be getting worse and worse. Is it climate change? Maybe. Is it, is it increasing population densities? Certainly, that's part of it. And these phenomena now are becoming more and more disastrous. There's seven billion of us here now, so it's, it's, it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Now you talked about earlier, you talked about how it's a decision to make when you decide this is going to be the purpose of my life. Yes. Now, obviously what you do is dangerous. And as you said, you take as many risks as you can in the safest way. How do you balance the fact that you're married? How do you balance the fact that, that you made a decision this is the purpose of your life? But what would you say to someone who says it's also our responsibility to take care of ourselves for the people who care about us? How is that a balance in your life? Whether you're an adventurer, whether you're someone who loves your job, how do you deal with the balance between what makes you feel complete and what you know can, can scare or even terrify the people who care about you? Right, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> what he didn't mention is that I got married on the crater's edge of an exploding volcano. So that was the next question. <laughs> she says, "Tell us a little oh, bit about that." Oh, well, okay. Sit here oh, I won't. I won't talk about that. Then. But marriage is a big enough adventure on its own. Tell us about what you came up with to make your right. wedding day a bigger adventure. It's actually a, it's, a, just <laughs> it's a nice it's a nice metaphor for 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 marriage. Actually, the whole erupting volcano thing. Um, <laughs> Love you. <laughs> Where was I? Um, uh, we were talking. I, don't know, I was just backing away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, that it becomes difficult. For you. Here's the here's the thing. I'm not the only person that deals with that problem. If you're if you're in the military, you're in constant danger. If you're a police officer, if you're uh, a firefighter. Anyone who has a dangerous occupation or does dangerous things has to deal with the reality that someday something could go wrong and, and your family has to deal with the aftermath, right? And that certainly is a concern. However, if you look at it strictly from, from a practical point of view, from a, I dare I say, mathematical point of view, statistically, I'm more likely to be killed you know, driving here 
more people are killed by car accidents, heart disease, and cancer than, than the things that I go after. And of course, yes, there's an, a slightly, el slight, I'm going to say slightly, <laughs> in air quotes, <laughs> slightly elevated risk for me to have a problem. Things do go wrong. And of course, the odds of something going wrong increase when you intentionally put yourself into these dangerous situations. But my wife Michelle and I, our relationship has grown at the same rate that my adventures have grown. When we started dating, it was right at the very beginning of my storm chasing uh, activities. And so as the years have gone by, she's very used to it, dare I say desensitized to it, um, to the point where if she wasn't here tonight, I could call her and say, hi honey, there's, there's been a, a volcano erupting in Japan. I gotta go. I'm gonna swing by, grab some clothes. I'll see you in a week and a half. And she'd be, okay, cool, come back in one piece. And I always promise her I'm gonna come back in one piece. And I've, I've so far been able to keep that promise. And I don't intend on breaking that promise either. I want to keep doing this for as many years as I can. So I don't want to take stupid risks. I take risks, yes, but I don't... I, at least I like to think that I don't take stupid risks. And I, I notice the hesitation in my voice when I say that. Because what's, what some people think is stupid, I sometimes think as... Exhilarating. Now you probably get that a lot. People, <laughs> doctors, lawyers, architects, engineers, students saying insurance agents. Yeah, what you do is <laughs> what what you do is <laughs> what you do is nuts. What what do you look at and say? There's no way I can't. Well, like what job? What scares me? What scares you? Well, lawyers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, being a lawyer or just lawyers in general? Just in general. Oh, okay. just in general. They 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 frighten me. Um, you fed great white sharks, right? I didn't feed the great white sharks. Oh, you didn't feed. No, it, I no. would have loved to. Um, I mean, things scare me. I'm 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 human. I'm normal. I mean, so the things that I that, <laughs> what? I didn't crack a smile there. You all laughed at that. <laughs> That wasn't even meant to be a joke. <laughs> um, I, 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 do, I get afraid when I do these things. Um, but I don't, I, my tolerance for fear is obviously a lot higher than most. Um, I don't jump out of airplanes every weekend, although I, do, I have done it a few times. Um, I, don't, I don't thrive on fear. I respect fear. I use fear to my advantage. And, uh, I mean, driving in certain parts of the world scares the hell out of me. <laughs> um, there are social situations that scare, that scare me. I mean, you know, like, imagine, like, in high school. Here, here's a great analogy. You're in high school. Think back. Way back. <laughs> Not so far back for you, because you're such if a If I just guy. start crying, just... Uh, <laughs> you know? And there's that girl, Susie Durkins, who's, who's two desks over, and you really want to ask her out. But you're afraid to, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, we're not, we're not having a moment here. All right. So Susie Durkins. Susie Durkins. Okay. So you want to ask her, but you're afraid to, right? Because they're, cause you're afraid that she's going to reject you and you're, you're afraid you're going to look like a fool. And, and soul crushing. And soul you know, crushing. Socially outcast. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Sorry. I'm following him. I'm yeah. <laughs> right. The guy who is able to muster up the strength to ask her out is as brave or certainly more, I would say, I would say more brave than I am when I'm driving into the eye of Hurricane Katrina. Because that is a very difficult thing to do. Um, and different people handle that, that fear in different ways, you know? It's, it's all relative. Fear is so relative. Stuff that scares me, you have no problem with. Stuff that scares you, I have no problem with. And it's different for every single person in the room, every person on, on, in the world, right? So, I mean, I don't mind having a tarantula crawl across my face. I've done that a couple of times, a couple of times. <laughs> you know, some people would just would have a heart attack just at the thought of that. So how do you define courage? Courage is having fear but doing it anyway. Courage is not about not having fear. Courage is about having the fear but realizing that there's something more important than the fear itself and doing it despite the fear. Now you said that your comfort zone is a terrible place to be. Yeah. So why is that? And what advice can you give to people who are struggling to step out of their comfort zone? Right. We spend a l It's funny because society these days goes to extreme lengths to make sure that we're comfortable, right? Risk is, is so diminished in our society. Kids can't even play ball these days because some kid might get hurt, right? And it makes me crazy when I hear these stories because life is a contact sport. And when we're in our comfort zone, 
let's say you're working at a job that, that you like but it's not great. You'd want to be doing something else. But the job is okay, so you're not getting that pain that makes you want to leave that job. If things get really bad, then you will, right? Or you don't have that pull of something that you're really passionate about. So what do you do? You sit in your comfort zone and everything is cool. It's the status quo. Things only change because of push or pull. Love or hate, uh, you know, pain or, or pleasure, right? If you have enough pain, you'll make a change. That's push. You are pushed to pay your taxes. You are pushed to go to school sometimes. You are pushed into a job that maybe you don't like. You do it, but you do it because you have to do it. Pull is where the power is because if you have something that you're very, very passionate about, you will get up early, you will stay up late in order to make steps every single day to reach towards that thing that you want. And it's that pull that's magic. That's what really pulls you out of your comfort zone and takes you to a place where you're doing things that you've never done. If you want something you've never had, you must do things that you've never done. What, uh, has there ever been a time where you said to yourself, if I get through this, I'm never doing this again? Ha! Ah, who? Yeah. Um, ha! Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably a few times. Um, Wow. It's funny because even when I think back now, some of the worst experiences, worst in terms of, of painful or worst in terms of, of hardship or, or, or frightening experiences, um, there are certain things that I don't have interest in doing again. We filmed this one episode. It's, it's in the box set, actually. And it's, it seems rather mundane, but at the time, it was, it was one of the toughest things I've ever done. We were doing this ski mountaineering trip in the Rocky Mountains. And... I had these guys with me who were these pro backcountry skiers. And we had to ski uphill, which is a lot of fun, let me tell you, up into the mountains in the middle of winter, and we were camped out for two nights up on this frozen lake. And my, basically, it was so painful for me, physically painful. I had blisters on my shins that were the size of pencil erasers, like the big guy. I had bruised ankles. I couldn't walk. I could barely walk. So. Um, if anyone wants to invite me skiing, I'm going to say no. <laughs> um, but yet the things like, like Hurricane Katrina, for example. The next time there's another big storm like that, I'm going to be, I'm going to be there for it. I'm going to be there for it. As frightening as it was, as, as dangerous as it was, I will be there for it. So it really does depend on the situation at the time and the emotions that you attach to those situations makes me decide whether I want to do that again or not. And being frightened is not doesn't really fit into the equation so much. I'll do stuff again that frightened me. But there are certain things that I might have found unpleasant. I'd rather not, I'd rather do something that frightened me than something that I found unpleasant twice. What, um, what adventure has, what adventure taught you the most? Like, do you find, do you find yourself referencing both out okay. loud and personally the most in your life? Yeah. And it actually, the one that scared me the most, it, 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 uh, I talked about this at, at uh, the TED conference. You've heard this story. Um, I was in Kenya, and it was in this, this cave called Kidam Cave. And the cave is famous for two reasons. Number one, it's the only place in the world where elephants go underground. They work their way to the back of this cave in the complete darkness. They've been doing it for generations, about 100,000 years. And they scrape the cave walls with their tusks, and they chew the rocks to get the salt into their diet. It's at very high elevations up in the mountains right near the Uganda border, and there's not a lot of uh, nutrients in, in the vegetation there. So this is what they do. It's a really fascinating part of nature. It's the only place in the world where this happens, and we wanted to go and try and document this. But the other reason why this cave is well known is because it was the epicenter for two outbreaks of Marburg hemorrhagic fever. And you've probably never heard of it, but it's the first cousin of the Ebola virus. And if you know anything about Ebola, if you catch it, you start getting fever, headaches, and within about a week and a half, your internal organs liquefy, and then you bleed them out of every orifice, and then you die. Not necessarily in that order, by the way. So, Anyone need a minute? <laughs> so... Let's go here, we decided. Okay. This, 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 is, this is a good place so to go. So go you're going to the cave where this happens? We're going to the cave where this happened. But, okay. like I said before, I try to do dangerous things in as safe a manner as possible. So, I brought with me a guy by the name of Don McFarlane. He is a bat biologist. He's a world leader 
in, in bat biology, the bats are somehow related to this disease. No one knows how it gets from the bats to humans, but the bats are involved. So I brought him. And he's also been to this cave several times. He's mapped it. So he knows it like the back of his hand. There's no one better to bring. So we're in the cave. I've got a full Tyvex coverall suit on. I've got surgical gloves. I've got a respirator, eye protection, helmet, the works. And we're at the back of the cave and my cameraman is with us. And at the back of the cave there's, I don't know, 200,000 bats. And you're wading through the bat guano to get to the back of the cave. And the biomass of these bats is so much that it warms up the temperature in the cave. So it's hot, it's humid, it's oppressive, it stinks like ammonia from, from all these bats. Pleasant place. It's, you should go there for a vacation. It's charming. And so he flips on the light and the bats scatter because they're afraid of the light. So they start coming at us and we're literally being barraged by thousands of bats crashing into us and they're emptying their bladders and their bowels the entire time as they're flying past us. Oh yeah, it's just, it's, a, it's marvelous. And I look over at Don and I see that he's caught one of these bats. It's like, that is so amazing. He caught one. I could catch one too and I could show it to the camera get a nice close-up of the bat so we can talk about this, right? Okay, cool. So I catch one and I turn to show it to the camera. And that's when I realized that I forgot to put on my thick leather gloves. And the bat bit through my surgical gloves and into my thumb. And now I didn't know if I had this Marburg disease, right? Which, of all the cases that have been uh, contracted in that cave, have been 100% fatal, right? There haven't been that many cases in the cave, but each one has, has, has killed the person who's caught it. So, like, that, it, that amount of fear was off the scale for me, um, mainly because it didn't just last for a moment. Like, if a bolt of lightning hits close by to me when I'm outside filming with my metal tripod... <laughs> um, they make them in plastic, you know that, right? It doesn't really, at that point, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, it's frightening for a second. If a tornado is coming towards me, it's frightening for a few minutes. If I'm in a hurricane, it's frightening for a few hours. This lasted a week and a half of not knowing what was going to happen. And we were going from Kenya, and not even coming back to Canada, we were continuing on to Uzbekistan. And if you know anything, actually I can guarantee you, you all know the full extent of the hospital system in Uzbekistan. It's pretty much zero. So it was, it was scary, it was frightening. And um, I kept taking my temperature every few hours to make sure I didn't have a fever and checking symptoms. And, and what I think I learned from that was, was how I react to fear in a prolonged state because I, I lived with it for so long, not knowing exactly what was going to happen. So I think that experience really allowed me to become good roommates with fear, so to speak, because it wasn't fleeting, because I was actually, I had to live with it for a long time. I basically had the experience of a terminal cancer patient being told they have cancer without actually having to experience the cancer. So I got the entire emotional roller coaster that was associated with that without the actual fallout of catching the disease. And that allowed me to, to learn more about how I learn, it, tolerate, and digest fear. Did, it, did anything change after that? Just my underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, sorry, of, I, had to, no, I, so I had to go for the cheap joke there just to lighten things up a bit. That's, yeah, well, my is, a lot of Did people, most people nod sagely when, when you hear these leadership cliches and such. And, right. Um, you learn more from failure than from success, which you know may very well be true. My question is, in a, in a world where failure generally means the worst possible outcome, yeah. Um, what is failure to you now when really success means not dying? Like, well, when you go on these adventures, obviously when we fail at things, you know, maybe we'll try, uh, Nuance will try a new initiative. People came, great, but if people didn't come, we'd try something else. Right. We'd learn from that failure. Yeah, the consequences are not that dire. Yeah, what are, what, how do you learn from failure? What do you consider failure? What do you consider success in a life that, that really has a tremendous extremes as opposed to a lot of of gray area. I, I have infinite levels of failure. It's not just, it's not black or white, it's not alive or dead, really. Um, for me, failure can be not being able to make it to the right store or, or blowing the forecast because we have to do all of our own storm forecasting. It's very easy to make mistakes. So we fail a lot. It happens. You know, statistically, you're going to fail more times than you succeed. So there's that. There's, there's, because I'm dealing with nature, 
things can happen, nature can turn on a dime. We flew to Newfoundland for Tropical Storm Isaac. While we're in the air, the storm turned out to sea. We landed, the storm was gone, nothing to show for it. Cameras, cameraman's there, ready to roll. Nothing. Failure, right? But that was out of our hands. There are so many different levels of failure, but the, but the way to look at it is this. If you can, if you can take something away from that, and the way I sort of describe it is that if, if you have a success, great, that's awesome. But if things go really badly, it makes for better stories. And it's true, at least in what I do, because I deal with many adventurous things. People don't want to hear how everything went great. They want to hear the, how things went bad. Right? What was the worst situation? How, you know, what was the most terrible thing that happened to you? Right? And it actually worked out well for us, especially making Angry Planet, because when things worked well, hey, we got the shot. It was amazing. When things went bad, hey, we got the emotional story of George failing. So even the failures became successes, and it's all about how you decide to interpret how things happen. Things don't have meaning except for the meaning that you give them, right? And again, that's a conscious decision. You have to decide on the meaning that you give the events of your life. And of the events of your life, because of this is what you do, mm. have, you just, have you seen a... Sh can you still get excited? Oh, every day. Uh, and, and that's just... Uh, is your life as exciting off the mountain, out of the cage, you know, whatever, away from the hurricane, do you still feel uh, that same excitement with the things that, you know, some of us would feel? Or are you one of those people who shifted so far away that you're like, oh, come on. You know, no, what, I how can I get excited about, you know, the first Christmas carol in, in the Eaton Center, which was today, by the way. Oh, was it really? For me. See, that's cool. For me. Yeah, that, oh, for you. Okay, if that doesn't count, you can go on Christmas Eve and it'd be the first one for you. Well, exactly. Okay, fair. And, well, fair. And, well, and as a single man, I probably will go on Christmas well, Eve. Well, there you go, yeah. <laughs> to shop for a drug market. Um... <laughs> <laughs> um, you can find excitement in anything. That's the cool thing about adventure. Adventure is all about stepping outside of your comfort zone. Right? That's where adventure begins. Adventure begins where your comfort zone ends. And that can be, that can be anything. It can be coming here and doing this. I've never done a forum like this before. This was cool. I was really looking forward to doing this, especially with you. So this is the kind of thing that, that I found very exciting to me. And my life is pretty mundane. Seriously, 99% of the time, my life is mundane. I do, when I'm not out storm chasing, I do freelance work still in, in, the, in the TV behind the scenes business, right? I still, I do the dishes. I, I, I take the dog for a walk, you know? It's, life is not all about what you see on television because that's only a tiny, tiny little slice of, of life. So you have to make the everyday moments Interesting and, and, and adventurous, and if you can if you can find adventure in, in a smile, then you've succeeded in finding adventure. You don't have to climb a mountain to find adventure. All you have to do is get uncomfortable. We went to, we talked Twitter, and then we went off on a different path. Mm. <laughs> what I wanted to mention is that you said it's been a big month. This month, you're featured in two books. Two books. Two books. Uh, Ripley's, Ripley's believe it or Ripley's not. Believe it or not. And uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul, the new Chicken Soup for the Soul, O Canada book. They, uh, they invited me to write a story for that. Now, how did those two things happen? Uh, what are the stories behind, what did you decide to write Chicken Soup, and why are you in Ripley's Believe It or Not? I, I didn't decide these things. They find me quite often. Um, it's really amazing the stuff, the people that knock on your door when you, when you are, when you publicly do the kind of stuff that I do, you get weird invitations. Um, yeah, it's, it's true. Literally, I had the publisher from Chicken Soup sent me an email. Said, hey, we heard about you through somebody that I did a, another speaking event through and um, we'd love it if you wrote a story for this, uh, this uh, basically it's 101 love letters to Canada. Mm -hmm. And they wanted me to write about how I became a storm chaser and my relationship with Canadian weather and basically the obsession that Canadians have with the weather because we are kind of weather obsessed here in Canada. And, and it was a great experience because I had never done anything like that before and it was very exciting and, it, and the book is now out and it's very, very cool. The Ripley's thing, again, they contacted me out of the blue and they were interested in my adventure that I did. It's, it's on that uh, box set where I went to this place called Kawa Ijen. It's in eastern Java, Indonesia. And there's this volcano there and at the bottom of this volcano is a lake of sulfuric acid. The largest in the world. pH of 
So if you remember your high school chemistry, that's about as strong as the battery acid in your car. And a I, lake. In a lake, huge lake. Right? Volcanic lake. It's steaming and it's, just, it's a pretty crazy place. It's like being on another planet. And there are guys there that, that mine the sulfur with, by hand with these crowbars and lifting 65 kilo baskets of sulfur out of this volcano. So I went there and I wanted to test the pH level at different parts in the lake and film it for the show. And uh, so there I am with this little inflatable rubber boat out on this lake of acid. And I took a Coke can. Talk about boating on acid, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> I took a Coke can, I scraped the paint off the Coke can, and I put it in the lake water, and it was sizzling like a steak. That's how strong this acid was. And because the boat was made of rubber, I knew the boat was not going to react. But I didn't know about the seams connecting the, the pieces of the boat together, and I wasn't sure about the paddles, because they were aluminum paddles and things like that. So I'm out there, and I was supposed to go out on the lake with um, this volcanologist friend that I'd met there, Donnie Wigianto. Great little guy, learned all of his English from Eddie Murphy movies. <laughs> Great. And <laughs> it's true. <laughs> oh, it's so true. And um, so he was going to come with me, but he hurt his foot the night before. Now, I'm not sure if he was lying or whether he was telling the truth, or whether he just didn't want to go with me or not. I'm not sure. I trust him, so I believe he actually did hurt his foot. And so it was just me going out there. And when it's just one person in a rubber raft, you know you have to cross your paddle over. Well, as you're crossing the paddle over, acid drips into the boat. Oh, yes. Right? Common and problem, I'm, I know. And I'm fighting a headwind, so I'm battling with the winds, trying to, trying to get from point A to point B on the lake. And then the next thing I realize, I'm, I'm kneeling in a puddle of acid. Mm. Oh. And it's burning my pants, and it's burning my legs, and it's like, okay, it's time to go. So here I am paddling back to shore, and as soon as I get to shore, I literally just took out a knife and, and cut off my pant legs, and there was, you can see it in the video, there's like steam coming off the, my pant legs, so that was pretty intense, and Ripley's thought that was a really cool thing, believe it or not, <laughs> and uh, next thing I know, I'm actually featured in two Ripley's books now, for that same adventure. In one month. Uh, one from last year, a new one from this year, which is like a Ripley's kids book, and... and and I'm also going to be featured in um, Motivated Magazine, this, uh, this new uh, episode of, or uh, not episode, I think in television terms, new edition, uh, issue, that's the word we're looking for, of uh, Motivated Magazine as well. As, as we begin to, to wrap up, I, I wanted to ask, um, uh, there's a, a portion of the video where you're uh, on the east coast of Canada watching waves slam into, I think it's Peggy's Cove. Peggy's Cove, And at Great one place. point you're just like, isn't it remarkable to, to see something that powerful? Um, obviously, you talk about um, we, we, one of our guests in, in a couple of weeks, uh, William Marsden, will talk about climate change yes. and uh, humans' power to impact the environment. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between nature's power and mankind's power now that you've, you use a lot of mankind's power to experience nature's power? There is no I, difference. It, it, True. There is no difference. You cannot separate man or mankind from nature. We are every element that is on this planet. The elements that make up the atoms that make up your hand, that make up your hat, that make up the lights in here, all came from exploding stars billions of years ago. We are made of those particles. And once we realize that, once we evolve to the point where you and I can sit here and have a conversation and know that we are made from, from the stuff of stars, that was the moment that the universe became self-aware. We are connected to each other biologically, we're connected to the earth chemically, and we're connected to the universe atomically. And we are nature. There is no separation. Did at one point you say this so destructive. Sorry, that was my Carl Sagan ish kind of moment there. I'm just proud I, I just thought I didn't just stare. I, you know, I was just like that we are all stardust. Now the you said that's so destructive and it's so beautiful at the same time. Yes. Um, can in going around the world uh, have you come to believe that you can create... Can there be something beautiful without destruction? That's oh, my yeah. deep question back at you. Oh, yeah. The, 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 the Nica Crystal Cave in Mexico, the most beautiful place I've ever seen. It's in Season 3 of, of Angry Planet. It took us two years to plan to go there. It's a cave that's it's about the size of a basketball court with the largest crystals ever seen. Some of them are 55 tons, 10 meters long. It's 52 Celsius with 100% humidity inside the cave. I had to wear an ice-filled suit just to survive for 35 minutes at a time inside this cave. The most beautiful place I've ever seen. It looks like 
the, the um, Fortress of Solitude from the Superman movies. It's just stunning. There's so much beauty out there. But, but I, see beauty, I see beauty everywhere. I see beauty in, in a tornado. I see beauty in, in waves crashing at Peggy's Cove. It's, it's, it's appreciating nature. And I understand that, that we, are, we are certainly um, having a tremendous influence on this planet, not necessarily in a positive way. There's far too many, uh, I personally believe there are far too many humans on this planet right now, and, and uh, we're going to have difficulty coping with it, and the planet's going to have a di- difficulty coping with it. But, but man, even with 7 billion people on this planet, there are still places that humans have not set foot. There are still some amazing discoveries to be made. There are still places to explore. There's lots of beauty still left out there, believe it or not. This is the leader's lounge. It is. How are you a leader? I think we all have the potential to be leaders. Leadership starts internally, I think, um, with your own uh, discipline and your own ability to, to see a vision through to fruition. And certainly, I have, I, when I'm on an expedition, if I'm filming, I certainly have to take a leadership role because I am responsible not only for the project but for the lives of those that are involved in the project and that's a pretty heavy responsibility and there are times when you have to make very split-second critical decisions so I have sort of been forced into that leadership role a lot of the time and I have experience because I I used to be um, the technical manager of the largest recording studio complex in Canada and um, I had a team that was working under me under very high pressure situations and there I see a lot of parallels between the business world and regular you know office leadership typical leadership uh, and comparing that to expedition leadership there are really a lot of parallels in that decisions often have to be made on a moment's notice yes they affect people sometimes in a positive way, sometimes in a negative way. You have to weigh the, the positive and the negative. And, uh, and sometimes being a leader is not about being everybody's friend. You have to be able to do what's, what is, you believe to be the right decision that may not always be the right decision for everyone that is, that is with you. But when you, when you take on a leadership role, I think one of the most important things is to treat the people in your team as peers, not as underlings. It's so important because to be able to work together as a team, it takes equals. And it takes a real big person to step down from that leadership pedestal and be able to put themselves in the trenches and do it in a convincing, I'm not going to say convincing, because in, do it in a, in a genuine uh, in a way. And, and I think that's certainly uh, an important part of it. My friend, why don't we turn it out to, to our audience here? But before we do, I just want to say, George, thank you very, very much for that. <laughs> what the hell? Okay. <laughs> Imagine that. Your first, your first broken bone. I know. So, yeah, just watch. I'm going to break a finger here at the Leader's Lounge. I can <laughs> Luckily, the hospital is close by. So. Does anyone have any questions for George? Good, sir. What's the strangest thing that you've been asked to do that you turned down? The strangest thing I've been asked to do that I've turned down. I have two, but this is the more sounds like the more interesting. Yeah, usually, usually the process like for making the Angry Planet show would would usually go starting like this. I would usually come up with an idea of something crazy that I wanted to do, and I would bounce it off the producers, and I would bounce it off the network, and it would sometimes be too expensive or sometimes be too difficult. Um, so most of the things were my idea. So it's kind of hard to to not do stuff that's your own idea. I'm trying to think if there's anything that I just flat out refuse to do. I can't really think of anything. Although I do have a tremendous Achilles heel. And that's my uh, penchant for seasickness. <laughs> and uh, the producer of the show is an avid sailor. So we ended up doing a lot of boat-related stuff. <laughs> so many things. And I get violently seasick. So we did a, uh, when we were diving with the Great White Sharks, it was a five day trip, live aboard dive boat. I they still wince whenever you say it. It's oh, man. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> come on, you love sharks, don't you? Not yet. You will. When I'm through with you, you will. Five days on the boat. Better you than the sharks. Yeah. Sick every single day. Um, just last January, Michelle and I, we, we went to the Bahamas to go dive with sharks without a cage. And I'm, I'm literally in the water in my scuba gear. I just say that off just so flippantly, right? Doesn't everybody do that? George, George has gotten me to make a deal with him that I will get into a tank with sharks. Um, and now he's got his, his wife enrolled in the, the mission as well. The cool thing is that um, in a tank, 
there's no way, so I won't get seasick. Oh, okay. But in the Bahamas, I was in my there's scuba sharks, gear. Though, right? still sharks. Okay. The sharks are no problem. I'm more worried about the seasickness. Um, bobbing in the water, still in my scuba gear, and being seasick into my scuba regulator. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Or in the zero gravity flight. Being, being, being sick while you're literally floating through the air <laughs> with a bag. In, you know, oh yeah. Oh. Oh, it's, it's, it's yeah. And then gravity kicks in when the, bo- when the plane bottoms out. They do these parabolic flights. So when you're cresting the top of the of the, the parabola, you're you're weightless. You're free falling inside the plane. But when you reach the bottom, all of a sudden it's two G's against the floor, and it's that alternating between the two that really sets off your stomach. And it was great for about eight. Parabolas. <laughs> the problem was there was another five or six after that. And too it much was, of a good thing. And it was hell. Yeah, too much of a good thing. Yeah, exactly. And they don't, they don't stop. You, know, you, you can't, stop you can't, you can't just. You know, it's like the TTC. You can't go ding. Let me off on the next stop. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Did you try? No, I was well, just. There you go. I was so consumed in just. Um, you talked a little bit about like network producers and yep. uh, insurance companies and those kind of containment atmospheres that have kind of brought in the bureaucratic nature of even jobs like what you have. Um, can you tell me about any experience that you've had with kind of the containment risk management um, brigade, so to speak, and, and, and how you overcome uh, a fight with them when they say, no, 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 you can't do this, but you really want it to. Waivers. Lots of waivers. Uh, like, for example, when we go and take people tornado chasing, the, you know, yeah, you've got this elaborate liability waiver that you have to sign. Um, the network was actually surprisingly good about letting me do pretty much anything. Never once did they stop me and say, no, don't do that, it's too dangerous. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. Whenever, <laughs> Just now that I think about do, it... Do you really need this cage for this great way? Yes. <laughs> You know, it'll make for better TV. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's kind of how it worked, because the more discomfort that I was in, the more they liked it. Because it made for better television, right? But they, at the, you know, they don't care. Um, so we would report into them just, just briefly. And that's probably a good thing. By keeping our contact with them minimal, it actually eliminated a lot of the bureaucracy involved. We literally traveled for between, wow, between 2006 and 2010, an average of about 220 nights out of the year, every single year for four years straight, just filming all over the world. So I would spend a lot of time away from home, and what we would do is we would shoot, send the footage back home to our editor, he would edit it, post it on the internet, we would watch it, make notes, send it back to him, he would then send it to the network for approval. And they would make a few, uh, you know, few recommendations and things like that. And meanwhile, we're off to somewhere else. This is now two months later. We're somewhere. The footage that we shot in Iceland, we're now screening it in an internet cafe in Timbuktu, literally. And by being so separated from that, it actually gave us a lot more freedom. And because the crew was so small, most of the time it was me and one other guy. That was it. Canadian television, not a huge budget, and we spent most of our money traveling, literally all over, right? So by having that separation it actually benefited us it's kind of like not telling your parents that you went to the party <laughs> beg, seriously beg forgiveness as opposed to ask exactly yeah and so we would actually get away with a lot of interesting stuff just by not telling them <laughs> welcome to the leaders lounge <laughs> <laughs> the back of the green here yeah, so what frustrates you about your job like listening to you you know it's all happening in the story that's true most of the time but there must be times you know where Absolutely. What frustrates you about? Oh yeah, there's so like it's so frustrating. Like, oh, the miles of driving. I, I typically when I'm tornado chasing, I leave at the end of April and I come home in mid June, and I never stop driving in between that entire that entire uh, time. Like I'll do, wow, twenty five thousand miles in six weeks sometimes and it's just it's horrible it's hellish because you're driving back and forth across the same highways across Kansas well it's not even like you're in it's not even like you're in Wyoming a lot you know in these or, or places big sky country it's like it's like Nebraska <laughs> And the, and the tourists love it when there's no tornadoes. To and play. when there's no tornado, that is, that is the worst thing for us. Is either when we miss a big storm, if we miss like the storm of the day, that's horrible. It's painful for us. Or if there's nothing going on and we have to entertain 
15 people in rural Kansas. <laughs> and you can only visit the world's largest ball of twine so many times. <laughs> and that becomes really difficult. And literally, it's so flat, it's so featureless, you can watch your dog run away for three days. <laughs> And sometimes the boredom is, is really difficult to deal with. That is worse. I, I would rather be uncomfortable dealing with something that's going badly than the monotony of driving across Kansas 20 times. <laughs> that is horrible. <laughs> yeah. I, I literally know every single little town in all Oklahoma, northern Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, I, like the back of my hand. I, I've, I've never spent my birthday with my wife because... I've been. It's you, my birthday, not hers. <laughs> we sp- I spent her birthday w- with her. You, you seem awesome, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> because my birthday falls in May, I'm always away for it, right? So it's just it's it's just so much driving and so much travel and so much bad food and and that's the the stuff that really it drags you down. It, it's really uh, grating. This conversation is actually quite timely for me because I work with students and I'm really passionate about helping them define their own definition of success. Mm-hmm. What's interesting is when you started talking about finding the extraordinary in the ordinary. A lot of my students like to define success by something big, something phenomenal. Um, and the whole reach and scope of what you do to them would be very inspiring because it is so huge. Right. And I'm wondering if you can expand on that a little bit more, because I'm trying to have these conversations with students. I'm like, well, I, I could never be this. I could never do what he does. I can't do this big thing because it is so big and so massive. Right. And I like your notion of finding the extraordinary and the ordinary, and that resonates with me, but I wonder if that would resonate with them. Well, here's the thing. Success is not a destination. Right. It is, it, and I mean, it's so cliche, <laughs> but it's true. Um, becoming a storm chaser is as much fun as being a storm chaser. And if you have that, that, I mean, that's my example, you know, becoming a whatever, becoming an astronaut, can be as adventurous as doing it because you're... (laughs) Because you're in the process. If you can make the process... (laughs) Thank you. You're a good man, Drew Dudley. Um, If if, if nothing more than a paperweight, you're a good man. I love you, man. I love. Oh, I. You don't. De- you so don't deserve that. That's a. Um, that's a big. A- hey, <laughs> bear in mind the type of winds he's used to dealing with. Okay. <laughs> Paper goes everywhere. That's true. As it's long, true. As long as I stay put. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm trained to be a storm chaser. I don't want to ever be blown away. So once I hit the appropriate weight, I will go into the heavy winds. That's when where I, that is. But when I was that. growing up, I never imagined that I would. Will, would have done accomplished things that I have accomplished. And the reason I was able to accomplish those things was because I really enjoyed engaging in the activities that took me in that direction. I love nature. I love photography. I love travel. I love exploration. And by doing these things, the things that you love, you get good at it. When you get good at it, people take notice. When people take notice, opportunities come your way. And it just becomes this snowballing effect, right? And you help people out, they help you out. And the next thing you know, you're a quote-unquote success. But the successes have been accruing sometimes for a decade or more. And when I started, like, I didn't, I didn't know anything. And, and when you look at someone like, you know, when Neil Armstrong, we, that's such a, a common example, when he was growing up, he didn't know the process of becoming an astronaut, but he knew what direction he wanted to go, and you follow the steps. And what I try to do is every day, I try to take at least one small step towards something that I want. And whether it's sending one email or whether it's... It doesn't matter. But I always try to make at least some progress every single day. And that helps me to stay motivated to, to continue and go on to the next thing and then the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So right now, the Angry Planet TV series is finished. We, we stopped shooting last year. We did three seasons, 39 episodes. And uh, right now, I'm in the process of pitching new ideas to new networks. I'm waiting to hear back from Discovery Channel for a project that I'm hoping to do with them, hopefully very soon, which should be very cool if it gets off the ground. So it's, the, it's as cliche as it is, it really is the process. If you can make the process the success, then you're always successful. As long as you keep moving, as long as you keep working on it, hey, 
like it's just gravy, you know. <laughs> yes, in the in the green, right, right behind. I was gonna say right behind Sarah, but you don't know who Sarah is. <laughs> <laughs> Georgia, of all the adventures that you've had to date, is there something that you aspire to do, some grand adventure that you haven't yet had the opportunity to? Many. Many. I, I've, I literally have a bucket list, like many people do. And for me, it's interesting because every time I check something <coughs> off, I add, tend, tend to add two more. And I, I never intend to complete everything on the list because I just keep adding things and adding things and adding things onto it. And there's plenty. There's so much travel I want to do. I want to visit. I want to visit 100 countries. Um, I want to uh, explore every single lake of lava in the world. There's only five. I've been to three. The other two are super difficult to get to. Um, I'd love to go into space. Uh, there's just so many things. And of course those are the big things, but there's small things too. And, and like I was saying before, you can find adventure in anything. And, and not everything is a, a big, <coughs> you know, event. But I've got lots of small stuff on my bucket list as well, you know. And, and a lot of it involves things that are not just adventurous. You know, you it, to lead a full, full rich life, you have to be diverse and do lots of different things or else you just become too over-focused. And I, I sometimes, I absolutely, I'm over-focused sometimes. And I have to be aware of that. In the yellow. Darcy, I'm sorry. In, in the yellow, you, old friend. <laughs> you mentioned about the uh, Crystal Caves in Mexico. Yes. Um, maybe you could describe one or two other favorite <coughs> places on Earth you've been to. Uh, since I've been to sure. <laughs> if, you, if you get the opportunity... Yeah. When you describe the crystal cave, like, wow. Yeah, it really is stunning. If, if just go onto my website, stormchaser.ca. You'll find it under the photo galleries. Um, you'll probably be there for a while. There's lots, lots thousands of photos on there. But um, um, Antarctica is another one of my favorite places. I had the wonderful opportunity to go there twice, actually, a couple of years ago. And the Antarctic Peninsula is so beautiful, you can just close your eyes, take your camera, just randomly aim, and each picture will be postcard perfect. It's just so beautiful. The wildlife there is not afraid of humans. So you can stand there and the penguins will come right up to you. Come on, little guy. <laughs> I think your penguin yeah. is dead. If that thing moves, <laughs> we're all out of here. <laughs> like you got some game, George. Yeah. If you can make that penguin I, I, move. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> um, and I was literally sea kayaking. And just surrounded by these beautiful icebergs and this 50 foot humpback whale just came right beside me and I could see her, she could see me and I was paddling, just keeping up with her just this beautiful connection for a couple of moments and then she dove down and went right underneath my kayak and it's just magic just amazing um, a few other really amazing spots in the world that I love uh, New Zealand is just stunning so much variety of terrain in a very small place beautiful wineries to volcanoes to beaches to ski hills to caves to you name it it's all in a very small uh, compact area um, it's just there's so many places but uh, Iceland stunning love Iceland great love to go back there expensive but it's fantastic I had the wonderful opportunity to go there and uh, interview the president about um, uh, uh, geothermal power, how they're a world leader in, in harnessing the, the geothermal power of the volcanic activity under their island. It's just a fascinating place. What's close to us? What's close What's to in us? our own backyard that we don't... That What's in our own backyard? Yeah. Canmore, Alberta. I love that town. It is great. It's, it's, it's an adventure. It's probably the adventure capital of Canada. Beautiful mountains. There's tons of things to do there. Ice climbing, Banff. That whole area, right in that part of the Rocky Mountains, is just stunning. The East Coast is amazing. Your East Coast... Uh, well, it's not technically mine, but... Well, no. But, I mean, Canada is so huge and so diverse. I've l really not explored nearly as much of Canada as I want to. There's so much I want to see. If you ever get the opportunity to go to the far north of Canada, to the Arctic, and uh, Baffin Island, it is just breathtaking. It rivals any other place I've seen in the world right here in Canada, but very few people get to go there because it is so difficult and the train is so daunting. We had to have a dog sled team in the middle of winter just to get into the Ayuituk National Park. And there was us and I think two other people in the entire national park. That was it. It's just, you have the whole place to yourself. It's great. Do you have time for a couple more? Yeah, I'm here. And we'll, I'm, and we'll I'm make good. It out. Yes, in the very back. 
That'll teach you. I was like, I, I think she's getting to the part where she's got to build. I think so, yeah. Yeah, don't try this at home. I just want to let you know you inspired them to steal their best story ever, and it's on YouTube. They're like, and they finally got the courage to show their dad. Send me the link. Send me the link. Email it to me. Or, yeah, I, I definitely want to see that. That's pretty cool. Um, that is a concern of mine. People, like, imitating, doing stuff that I, that, that I do. Seriously. Like... When I say don't try this at home, I mean, I mean it, because I understand that, yes, kids will want to emulate some of the things they see on television. But on the other hand, we all need to take responsibility for our own actions, and I'm a huge advocate of taking personal responsibility for everything that we personally do. Um, but that's easy for me to say, you know, when kids try and emulate some of the things that I do, which can be quite dangerous, especially if you don't know what you're doing like copping in your car and heading into a tornado watch. Um, but I feel I'm, when you're gonna say I'm when torn your about that. Buy a motorcycle. You yeah. got nothing, Dad. They got you on DVD. Yeah. When your children come and go, Dad, I really want to buy a motorcycle. No. <laughs> Don't do... Oh, all right. Yeah, well, yeah at this, you know, I, I really have no credibility in that. In that <laughs> I, I can't tell people to not do stuff. <laughs> I really can't because they'll just look at me and shake their head and it's like, yeah, you got me. <laughs> once, yeah. once you got in with the shark, that's pretty much over. <laughs> So there are, I see it as there are intentional and unintentional environmentalists. I've got one side is Al Gore, to his teammate, the decision this is what my cost is going to be. And there's the unintentional, it's like Steve Irwin, uh, Jack Kenneth, that are just interacting with it, like yourself. Yes. Do you see yourself on that spectrum somewhere, and how comfortable are you with that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I see myself as an ambassador to, to the planet, um, because... Because I explore the most extreme portions of it, it gathers a lot of attention. So by using that attention, I can help spread the word of, of how the planet is indeed so precious and some of these sites are so rare. Uh, for example, that crystal cave, it was accidentally found by silver miners drilling underground. Boom, they came across this, the most beautiful place on the planet, accidentally discovered, and it's below the water table. At some point, the mine is going to shut down because they run out of silver. They have pumps that operate 24 hours a day, 7 days a week to keep the water out. At some point when they run out, they're going to shut off the pumps and the whole thing's going to flood. We'll never see it again. So by me going there and documenting it and showing it to the, to the world, it's like, look what's there. There's other treasures out there too. So I want kids especially to appreciate nature. Like when was the last time your kids touched a tree? You know? When was the last time you touched a tree? <laughs> we are so disconnected from nature. We, we get up in our air-conditioned homes, we get into our air-conditioned car, we go to an air-conditioned office. Repeat as necessary. I repeat ad nauseum. <coughs> right? I want people to understand that there's more out there and it's really amazing. The Earth is a great, amazing place. It's the only planet we have. It's probably the only planet we will ever have. Certainly this generation. We're not going, we're not going to Mars for a while. We're certainly not colonizing it this generation. So we have to be able to, to preserve what, what's there and, and appreciate our place in nature. And sometimes our place is, is fleeing from these events, <laughs> but they're just part of business as usual on planet Earth. Yes, this will be our last one. The emotional stages? Uh, because I remember watching a TED talk of someone who was on a plane, uh, like a plane that landed on Hudson River in New York. Yeah. Because it's an active experience, taking a bad wine factor, because the wine is ready and the people are there at all. So do you actually have to go through some kind of like near death experience to really um, become someone who can just go for it and without a I don't think you have to be 
put through a near-death situation in order to to squeeze all the juice out of life. I think that's what it takes for some people. And for me, it didn't really happen in that cave where I got bitten by the bat. For me, it was it was fear. It was understanding it, dealing with it. But I didn't have a major epiphany that made me change the way I live. It didn't make me decide to, uh, you know, go go ride a motorcycle and have a midlife crisis or anything. I've my my life has been a steady progression, and I think because of that, I'm sort of uniquely positioned in that. My life is just completely, you know, ramped up in that respect, in that in that adventurous exploration sort of realm, and that experience, to me, as traumatic as it was, was just another event in a series of extraordinary events that I've been able to experience and share with the world, uh, albeit it was the most frightening. But it, it's I don't I didn't go through the whole denial thing. I didn't go through the uh, you know this, what is it, the seven steps seven of stages, the yeah. seven stages of, of, of uh, I forget what the actual terminology is, but grief. Grief. Thank you. Um, I didn't really experience that at all because I knew going in the danger. It was just the realization that it had potentially come to fruition. So it wasn't completely out of the blue. I knew the dangers there, and I was protected almost fully, almost as protected as I should have been. And it's my own fault. I have no one to blame but myself because I had the gloves that I needed in my backpack that I was wearing at the time. So it was just a momentary lapse of judgment. I took advantage of the situation. The bats were coming out. And I just didn't think I had time to put the gloves on and I didn't think it was going to be a problem. But that's how mistakes happen. And sometimes just because I deal with such dangerous things became a potentially um, you know, life-changing event. But I don't think it changed my life that much, as much as you might imagine. Anyone else wonder what a midlife crisis for George would look like? <laughs> Having a midlife crisis, I'm going to go to an office. Yeah. <laughs> I am actually thinking about buying a motorcycle. Really? I'm thinking about it. You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> George, I want to say thank you very, very much. Pleasure. <laughs> George Corotis, everyone. Thank you.